Hello again, everybody. This is Jamie Kelly with the Elvis Archival Preservation Society. If you're a big Elvis fan like us, this is your society, our society, the EAP Society. If this is your first time on the channel, welcome. We're glad to have you. If not, welcome back. Be sure to like, share, comment on the video, subscribe if you have not yet, because when we hit 20,000 subscribers, we're going to give away some cool stuff, including an Elvis Presley personally owned item. We have a live event coming May 3rd to the 5th, 2024 in Nevada, Iowa. It's going to be a lot of fun. Three days of Elvis fun that will not break the bank. And best of all, the proceeds go to our endeavors to make sure that Elvis history is not lost to history. Uh, if you would like to help us even more in that, please consider becoming a member of the society. We would love to have you. Go to eapsociety.com, click on become a member, paid member tiers, get the cool perks that you see below. All right, this is part two of what initially was just going to be a one part series, but now is going to be three. We think it's going to be three, might be more than that. Anyway, as soon as we started part one, we thought, ah, oh, it'll just be one part. By the time we finished part one and got it up, we knew there was going to be two. I'm currently recording two, and part three is going to be coming as soon as we can. This is going to take a little more legwork. The threads that we are sort of unraveling in this Sun Records acetate iceberg are really interesting and kind of deep cut. So I hope you've been enjoying these so far. Hope you enjoy the video today. And we do have part three that John and I will both be coming back for uh, as soon as we can. So anyway, as I said, John did a really great job with part one. There were a few misconceptions and questions that people had, so we want to be sure that that's all cleared up moving forward so that way nobody's confused as we move into part two. Now, first off, we want to make sure everybody understands we do not make any assertions, accusations, or assumptions of ill will or ill intent on the part of the estate for unveiling and presenting the acetate to everybody in Elvis's birthday. We truly and sincerely believe that it was good faith and we have no reason to believe. Otherwise, we know a lot of the folks over there. We like them. So it's nothing like that. Um, the, the acetate just raised a whole lot of questions, and then that turned into a giant rabbit hole, which is why we are making the videos that you're seeing. <laughs> so anyway, want to make sure everybody knew that this was not any kind of accusatory thing on our part at all. So also, had a few folks had questions about the acetate that John and his dad have. Now, it is a double-sided acetate. And by the way, yes, double-sided acetates are definitely a thing. The My Happiness, That's When Your Heartaches Begin acetate is one of those. The I'll Never Send In Your Way, It Wouldn't Be The Same Without You is one. The I Have An Acetate from the Radio Recorders Session for King Creole. It's got uh, New Orleans and then one of the alternates, the slower alternate for King Creole on there. Nothing that you haven't heard, so just so, just so you know. But so two-sided acetates are a thing, but because it is a two-sided acetate, therefore it is not, and is not asserted to be in any, any, in any way, the single-sided That's Alright Mama acetate that Dewey Phillips played the first night. That's not what, that's not the reason that was brought to show everybody. The reason they brought that forward so you could see it and hear it and all that was for context. So that way you understand, okay, this is the way Sam would operate with this, and so that leads to why we have questions, or part of the reason why we have questions for that. Now, I don't have a Sun Records acetate with Sam Phillips' handwriting on it. That is freaking cool. By the way, I did want to say really quickly before we go any further, uh, I know John's dad said a couple of times, you know, this is the birth of rock and roll and all this kind of stuff. He's just excited. He's just expressing his excitement. That's all. So, as I said, I don't have uh, a Sun Records acetate, but what I do have to contribute is... I've recorded, I've recorded four albums at Sun Studio. So this is the workstation for the EAP Society. This is where I do all the video editing, but this is also where I do my own like mixing and mastering and all that kind of stuff. And so this is gonna be useful today so we can play you some things and this will be fun. Now, and on the desk here, I've got a bunch of things that are Elvis related. Everything that you see here, including this, has an Elvis connection of some kind. If you know the Mario Elvis connection and you know the Elvis connection over here, I'll give you all a second to uh, pause and look. <laughs> Let me know in the comments. Also, the keyboard and mouse, no Elvis connection there. It's just this stuff. Anyway, so yeah, I'm really uh, I'm looking forward to seeing who gets this. So, all right. This also has 
at least a Sun Records connection because this is the of the award that I won for Rockabilly Song of 2006 from the JPF Independent Music Awards. And that <laughs> is from this album, my second album, uh, recorded in 2003, came out in 2004. This was volume two, which came out uh, in 2006, was recorded in 2005. This has two songs on it that I wrote and was with the Dempsey's. By the way, the pictures were from Autumn Drive, which is neat. And in 2005, sorry, 2004, was released in 2005, we made two CDs of karaoke material, which at the time was basically everything from Sun and the Hayride, including the important alternate versions. So 18 tracks and 17 tracks. The reason why I bring this up is because I'm going to use the multi-track recorded at Sun Studio to kind of demonstrate some of the different sounds because we had folks that were not sure, well, you know, what what's with the echo? What's with the, you know, is it echo? Is it reverb? What is it? What is the history of this? What did RCA do? What did Sam do? What is the difference with all of that? So I'm going to kind of give you a demonstration today to show you a little bit about that and give you greater context on the audio format. Because while I don't have a Sun Records acetate or a Memphis Recording Service or Sam Phillips um, acetate, I do have knowledge for having recorded four albums at Sun. And James Lott, by the way, at Sun Studio was one of the best people to work with. And he taught me a lot about a lot of this stuff. So it's pretty nifty. Anyway, so what we're gonna do is we're going to pull up the recording that I made in 2004, which is crazy to think that it's 20 years old. And so I've got my copy of That's All Right Mama that we did. And it's a recreation of the original recording. And I've got my guide vocal in there. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. Because a lot of folks were saying that with the video that Graceland put out, they put out two videos, actually. They put out the uh, proclamation live stream video that showed them, you know, presenting the acetate, unveiling and presenting the acetate. And then they have another one, which is a really neat presentation of, you know, you see the footsteps walking into the office and then the, you know, then they put the needle or they seem to put the needle on the record in a place. So people said, well, it, it looks like they're not really playing the record and that's not a live play audio that we're getting. And that's absolutely correct. And we know that particularly in the one with the footsteps into the office, because when actually I can use this as, as a good example, because when the needle gets to about here, the record is spinning and they got, uh, and the pops and cr clicks and crackle and all that kind of stuff start almost immediately. Well, if you're still taking a needle across there and it's actually touching, it's not going to sound like pops and clicks. It's going to sound like, <clears throat> and so not great. That's a good way to ruin a very valuable, potentially acetate. So it's a good thing that they didn't do that for that reason. It's a good thing they're not playing it live for that reason. Also, because if it's the kind of model that we think it is, it's a $40 record player, and that's you don't want to play an acetate on a cheaper $40 record player. So fans have been saying, well, this makes total sense. They've got a little record player just for show. They brought the acetate out. They set it down just for show. They make it, you know, they act like they're playing it, and everybody knows what That's All Right Mama sounds like. No big deal. Uh, they play a version of That's All Right Mama with some added crackle. No problem. That seems like that makes sense. Of course, they wouldn't want to do that to the actual acetate. They wouldn't want to play that, especially on a really cold day. <laughs> and that makes sense. That makes total sense. But the audio that plays specifically is interesting. And I think sheds light in ways that while not necessarily intended, could be very informative. There's a lot that we can glean from that. So let's say that you're, you've got this acetate and you want to present it in a couple of different ways. So you have, you do a public presentation and you make a video, both of which are really cool. So you want to, you want to do this and you need audio. The easiest places to get audio are from the boy from Tupelo box or one of like the earlier CD sets or something like that. Makes sense, right? So 
The easiest place to get it would be like from a boy from Tupelo. And there are two masters of That's Right Mama that are on A Boy from Tupelo. And there have been some other places where that's been presented like that as well. The first is the Dry Sun 209, which is what this Mother Stamper uh, copy was made from. Uh, this is the Dry 209. Or you've got the RCA Master. The audio that I heard was not from either of those two masters. And we're going to get more into that when we come back from these messages. All right, welcome back, everybody. We have been talking about the audio that was played on the two YouTube videos, the live stream presentation for Elvis's birthday, and also the uh, acetate presentation where they walk in the office, you hear the footsteps and all that kind of thing. Which, by the way, I, I still I love the presentation of those videos. Now, when I heard the audio, in both cases, the audio matches. And when I heard the audio, it took me back to my childhood. Because I remember 50s recordings sounding like that. The problem is, my childhood is the 80s. But this audio dates back further than that. But we're going to get into like the histories of all of that. So this is a big piece of my childhood, not the CD, I had the LP. This is a big piece of my childhood, one of my favorite albums as a kid, I played the heck out of it. I wrote Elvis's name all over the thing, the album is falling apart. One of our season one videos, we actually bring that thing out and it's just like flopping apart. <laughs> so um, anyway, this audio has a lot more reverb on it than the one that is normally available, as I said. The two that seem to be the most easy to find these days is the completely dry original Sun 209, which was not always the case for a very long time, was not the case, or the first RCA master tape that they made using the original dry Sun tape. The one with extra reverb hasn't been really in major circulation for a decent while, so it would be... So it's interesting that if you're going to grab audio to just play alongside presenting an acetate, it, it's not as probable that that's the audio that you'll find to grab. It's possible. It's certainly possible, but it's not probable because it's certainly not easy. Um, there are very few digital places, especially, to get that sound. As a matter of fact, this doesn't even have, this CD does not even have the authentic sound on that. That's the Japanese paper sleeve, by the way. Awesome disc. So where's the audio coming from then? It's probable to me that what they did is they made, in good faith, as we said, a transfer of the acetate beforehand and then used that for both the live presentation and the YouTube video. That would make the most sense because, again, if they're going to pull audio, it's probably not going to be the audio that we heard. So that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense because that master is, hasn't been heard or hasn't been in regular circulation for some time. There was a time when that was basically the only one you could find, and we're going to get into that. So then the question becomes, what is the history of reverb and echo and what Sam did, and what RCA did, and what they did again. How does that work? What is the sound like? Okay, so as I said, I've got my multi-track master from 2004, and the reason I'm using this and I'm not using the original is because I can go into the individual tracks, and with the audio being cleaner, it's easier for you to hear the differences between dry, echo, reverb, etc. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to play a little bit of this dry with no reverb or echo or anything at all like that. So you just get a sense of what it's like by itself. And what I've tried to do is more or less set things where they are level-wise in comparison with each other so that way all of this stuff sort of works. Now, if we take my vocal, 
the way Sam and John explained this in part one, but I'm going to go into a little bit more of a detail here. So the way Sam did effects, because he didn't have a reverb chamber. He didn't have the access to that. He didn't have the ability or the space at Sun to do it. So what they would do is he used something, he used a tape to create a delay. And echo in this case means delay. If you check out the master of Blue Moon in Kentucky, you hear when Elvis is like, uh, keep shining bright, bright, that bright, bright, that second, that is the echo. That is what they call slapback echo because it's boom, 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 boom. It's an answer back or a repeat, essentially, that just comes a little bit later. Now, the way Sam would do that is he'd have all, everything mic'd and would go into the board, would go into the first machine. That's the main machine. Then he would mic just those things that he wanted to put uh, echo on, and those would go into the board into a different machine. And then you turn that and you can use that to control the speed with which it goes into the main machine. So you can control the speed and the volume and all of that stuff pretty easily there. It's a, it's a really cool little process. So this is, now I'm going to kind of exaggerate this so you can get, so you really hear the difference. So here's, I've got my vocal soloed. And apologies for a 20 year old vocal, but here we go. I've got my vocal soloed and I'm gonna start dry and then I'm gonna add the echo so you can hear the difference. So when you hear that, you can hear it kind of fattens the sound up a little bit and it's like that. But it does have this really cool like fattening effect to the sound, which is really, it's really neat. It's really special. It's a great little effect. And if you want to hear what like just the tape, just the secondary tape sounds like, a good example of this is when it rains, it really pours because they can't find the master tape. What they found was the echo tape. So they call it, I've heard it called the dry re reverb tape, which makes no sense to me because it's an echo thing. So anyway, so the dry echo tape is on, uh, you hear bits of that with um, when it rains, it really pours. It's also on, I'm counting on you. So they had some sense of what they, what Sam was doing, at least by the second day of Elvis's first session. So then, okay, so we're going to do that also to the guitar in the solo, so that way you can hear what that is like, and that's also going to be a good place to test the reverb, but we're not going to do that just yet. Okay, here's just a little piece of the solo. Now check this out. You hear what that does to the sound of it? All right, now this is a good place to talk about reverb. So chamber reverb works like this. You've got a room that is either concrete or plaster. In the case of Studio B, it was plaster that was painted yellow because everything, they were doing all kinds of experiments to make, to see what would change like a room tone. So it was a domed upper room that was above the studio in the case of Studio B, it wasn't always like this, but this is the way it was there. But chamber reverb works that you've got a speaker, as John said in part one, you've got a speaker on one side that is kind of playing what is being performed downstairs, or at least whatever they want to put reverb on. And so that's in there. And then there are microphones set up in the other part of the room. So the microphones pick up the reverberation of sound that is kicking from the speaker, bouncing off of the walls. The microphone picks those up, and depending on where the microphones are in the room, it picks up a different sort of tone and sound. That's how you can kind of control that. And so this is... Okay, so now we're going to go back and play the dry uh, guitar, just so you can hear it again. Okay, so again, that's the dry. Now, I'm gonna part way through, I'm gonna turn on the reverb so you can hear it. This is what 
Uh, let's see, let me pull that right about there. Okay, all right, here we go. I'm gonna point when it starts. It's kind of splashy, right? Anyway, so it kind of has a little bit of a splash to it. Okay, so this is going to give you an example of what it sounds like when the microphones are in different parts of the room. As you see, we can kind of move them in different parts here. So uh, this is sort of obviously just an approximation, but still. Now, I'm going to play this with the microphones being next to the speakers, and I want you to hear the, the more direct and the kind of clicking from the guitar that you can pick up. When you, you listen for the don't don't don't, you'll you'll hear a little bit of the clicking from the, from the picking. Now, as we move the microphones back, that sound is going to change, and you're going to hear a lot less of that. It's going to be more of the boomy, splashy stuff. Now, check this out. So as you can hear there, that kind of gives you a sense of how sound changes depending on where the microphone is in relation to the speakers. If you want to experiment with this for yourself, uh, set your phone up on a tripod or something like that in a concrete hallway and record yourself and always be facing the camera. So make sure you, there's nothing to trip on behind you. So go real close to the camera and do something like pop or something with like, a really quick so you can catch what the sound is coming off of the sides of the room, right? So do this really close to the phone and then walk back and do it again and walk back further and do it again. And then you'll notice that the further back you are, it's the same kind of principle. That gives you an idea of the way that they would do that. So that covers echo and chamber reverb. We're gonna talk about plate reverb and compression when we come back from these messages. Welcome back everybody. All right, we just got done talking about the tools of the trade for early Elvis recordings. We talked about Sam's and the slapback echo, and we talked about RCA and the chamber reverb that they would use. Now, in 1957, the EMT 140 was made and it is a plate reverb. RCA went nuts with these things. They had three in almost every studio, at least, in almost every studio that they had. The nice thing about plate reverb, the way that that sort of works is, let's say you've got, um, let's imagine for a moment that this was like aluminum or tin or something like that. And whenever you have a, like a piece of tin and you thunk it in the center, it would reverberate and you would hear the sound go, that kind of thing. Again, very splashy, even splashier in a lot of cases than what you would get from chamber reverb. So what was what was kind of figured out, and this is a very rudimentary way of putting this, but you've got an amplifier that has receptacles connected to the plate, so it reverberates from the center, it's like basically like a speaker there. So it it feed it it pushes that sound into the plate, so that way the plate vibrates and that causes the reverb. So they have things connected to it that go to the board. And so that way the sound reverberation that is on that plate goes back into the board and they can play with that. Now, these units were pretty huge, but they were not nearly as large as a chamber reverb room would need to be. And now we're gonna go into plate reverb and then we'll cover compression. So for plate reverb, I'm gonna give you an idea. Again, we're gonna go back to the guitar so you really get a sense of that. So this is dry. Okay, so that's dry, just so you all had a chance to hear that again. Now, partway through, I'm gonna turn this on so you can hear the difference. that so yeah it's still going that's very splashy now uh bill porter loved this thing in the 60s but 
Anyway, so this gives you a really good sense of the way plate reverb works. Now, I'm gonna show you what that sounds like on its own because this is pretty fascinating. So, when RCA got Elvis's uh, contract, and Elvis is now an RCA artist, and they're going to re-release Elvis's son singles while they're waiting for Elvis to go in and record, they, they, they think, well, hey, his stuff is going up the charts, let's put it out ourselves, and we'll be good. So, again, this is our version of That's Right, Mama, and this is Dry. <laughs> If you'll notice, and this is true on the original as well, uh, the acoustic is a little bit lower. Um, everything is there, but you know it's it's very it's very spacious. It's very open. It's not um, it's not splashy because there's no it's dry. There's no reverb or echo or anything like that on it. But um, it, everything just kind of sits where it sits. So what RCA would do is they used compression to just kind of squeeze and fatten the sound a little bit. Now I'm gonna play you what that sounds like right here. So uh, basically this is a good way to sort of congeal tones so that way certain things that are a little softer are brought up a little bit and it kind of tames some of the louder stuff to a degree in ways. All right, so here, here's the before and after. I'm gonna use my finger to point. <laughs> You hear how, I mean, yes, everything's louder, but it just kind of fattens the sound out and just, and that's what compression does. It just compresses it in. So RCA got the tapes from Sam Phillips in December of 55. Uh, and then if we have our dates right in January, around January 20th, they did some retransfers to make new masters essentially. Um, so they had those accessible to them. So what they did is they took the dry tape of That's All Right Mama, at that point they had the tape still for the master, and they played it through their system, they applied some chamber reverb, and they applied some compression. And so now I'm gonna show you what that sounds like, approximately. So here's the whole thing. <laughs> So you hear the trail at the end. So that's that's basically where they ended up, more or less. I mean, I didn't do any major tweaking to this. This is just to give you a rock, rough approximation. So this is the that's basically what was applied to the original Dry Sun Master when they put it out for 45s and 78s in early 1956. So at that point, this is what existed for Elvis's master, That's All Right Mama. After that, RCA, I guess, decided they didn't need the dry tape anymore because it wasn't useful to them. They had a better one that they fixed and it just kind of got discarded. The dry one got discarded, which is the first, maybe the first in a long line of boneheaded decisions by RCA, but that's a whole other thing. So now we've got the dry tape at this point does not exist anymore. RCA has their fancy, splashy new master, and they're good. As I said, in 1957, the EMT 140s uh, are manufactured and start coming out, and RCA is really excited about that. Well, in 1956, you start seeing a lot more, I mean, Elvis is doing songs with more reverb, and especially in September of 56, there's a lot more reverb on the material. So sounds are changing as time moves along. And RCA is coming out with a new album in 1959 called For LP Fans Only. Now, this is going to be a lot of songs that basically had not been out on LP or EP, I believe, before. So it was kind of collecting the singles stuff for the people that like to buy albums. And this was another way for RCA to sell albums while Elvis was in the army. But 
So what they had, now they've got their slightly compressed and slightly reverbed tape. That is their new master. But it's going to be sitting alongside things like playing for keeps and that kind of stuff. So what do you do? Well, the decision they made was to add what I believe, but I might be wrong on that, but what I believe to be plate reverb and a little more compression. So now we're going to go through that process. So this is our 2004 version now with chamber and with chamber reverb and uh, compression. <laughs> I think that there's extra compression added is because the bass is considerably louder in that version, uh, to my ears anyway. So it brings that out even more in this case. So for LP fans only comes out and because they now have an album master that sort of becomes for a good long while, the de facto version of that's All right. Mama, when they go back, to That's Right Mama, that seems to be what they use most of the time. All right, we are going to look a little bit more into the more modern history of this and how that fell back out of favor when we come back from these messages. All right, welcome back, everybody. We've been talking about the history of how That's Right Mama got reverberated, I suppose. So in the 60s and the 70s, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, the version of That's Right Mama that was heard on LPs or reissues and things was usually from the four LP fans only because that album actually got reprinted for a, a decent while. This continues through... Uh, I know that there are some versions that released overseas that did not use that master. They used the earlier master, which is good. But uh, for a lot of releases, the main one that you could grab a hold of was the one that was originally on for LP fans only. Then Ernst Jorgensen comes in to BMG, well, to RCA, which will become RCA BMG, which is now owned by Sony, but at the time was BMG. He comes in and he wants to find the most true to original masters for the 50s box that he possibly can. So he's cleaning up the catalog, essentially. So he goes through all of the masters and he's trying to find the best ones. Well, of course, the 4LP fans only would be an easy find because they've been using it. But then he goes back and he finds RCA's original lighter reverb and much less compression transfer. And that's the original one that they do off of the dry tape. The dry tape one is discovered to be missing or discarded. Again, it uh, boggles the mind. But that is what he uses. And because that is a much closer to original source, that now becomes, because he's in charge, so that becomes the version of That's Alright Mama that goes into prevalence. The one on four LP fans only kind of gets not tossed away, but set aside and not really used because it is no longer, it's no longer considered the best version of the master of That's All Right Mama. Then, you know, fans are clamoring for, well, we want it closer, we want it better and all this kind of stuff. So then the dry version of a 78 is transferred. And then that is why on a boy from Tupelo and some other releases, you've got the dry master finally going back to the original sound of Sun 209. That leads us to today. You've got the dry Sun 209 sound and you've got RCA's first transfer with again, a little bit of compression and a little bit of reverb. Those are by far the easiest versions of That's Alright Mama to find. So it would make sense if you just want something to play for people, you're going to grab something that's easy to get a hold of. And the easiest things to get a hold of are going to be those two versions of the master. The for LP fans only versions uh, would be, you kind of at this point have to go hunting for them if you want to find them. It is possible that they could have been used, but it's not likely. 
And again, I think a good faith effort was made. I think it is my, it is my opinion uh, that what is most likely is that Graceland in good faith transferred the acetate that they had professionally and then played that transfer back because it's the same record. It's fine. You know, what's the problem? And if that's the case, that's actually a really good thing because that gives us information that we would not have had otherwise. So if that's the case, I want to take this moment to say thank you for doing that because if that is the audio, that sheds a lot of light on origins. And I think it's really, it's important information that we wouldn't have otherwise. So that helps other fans and collectors in the future, as well as we're going to get into this video as we've gotten into, and then also into part three. Anyway, so that is a little bit of a, a, <laughs> a romp, I guess, into the way slap echo was applied usually and the way chamber reverb and plate reverb work. Hope that you've enjoyed this and hopefully you've been able to hear the difference. Uh, you know, use your headphones and all that kind of stuff. I know we're playing this off of a microphone and it's not direct audio, but it still should basically give you the, the general idea so you can hear more of what the difference is. I did want to give a little bit of info as we prep for part three. It's going to take a little bit more time than we have between parts one and two, but wanted to make sure that we gave you this information in the meantime. If you see an acetate with Memphis Recording Service where the red logo does not stretch all the way to the edges of the label, if it's a little smaller and centered, and if it's a 10 inch acetate playing at 45 RPM, those are red flags. They're possible, but not necessarily probable. Sam's machine cutter, Sam's like acetate cutter machine could do 45s and 33 in the third actually. But as John said in part one, most of the radio stations were still playing 78s. So if you're going to give something to a radio station, you're going to want to give them something that they're going to have the easiest access to because you want them to play it. So it makes the most sense that 78 RPM is what you would do. And we know that Sam actually preferred 78 RPM for a lot of, uh, even after the format sort of fell away, there are examples of 78 RPM records that Sam made when he was still doing like, just kind of like general people coming in wanting to record something, he still would do 78 RPM. So that's kind of an inter interesting little tidbit. So if you see those things, uh, possibly red flag, something to be aware of just for your information. So anyway, hope you've enjoyed this little dive into the audio aspects of what I caught when I first heard that. I was like, oh, wow, that's all kinds of things just kind of hit me like a ton of bricks when I heard it. So this is a little bit of a walkthrough. So thank you all so very much. I did want to say really quickly that um, what you're seeing here, we're going to be putting up a fundraiser because we are fundraising for uh, studio equipment and restoration equipment. It's going to be about a week or so. We're going to put up a video about that. So if you want any of this crazy stuff, we will have some of that available as a way to raise funds for the EAP Society. So anyway, thank you so much for checking out the video and the channel. I really hope that you've enjoyed what we've been putting out. And thank you so much to all of our members, especially our very own Colonel, Colonel Miles Foreman. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, everybody that has submitted information to us, thank you. Uh, this has been an amazingly fascinating rabbit hole, and we hope that you're enjoying hearing about this as much as we did enjoying reading and listening and researching and all this kind of stuff. It's been blowing our minds, to be honest. So thank you all so much, everybody, and to everyone involved in all of this, to the estate and everything else. Again, we're here to help. If we can be of any assistance at all, we're happy to. That's the main reason that we're making these videos is to help everybody out so that way they have information to uh, make uh, the best possible decisions. So anyway, I am Jamie Kelly with the Elvis Archival Preservation Society. Whole point is to make sure that Elvis history is not lost to history. And no matter what, 
No matter what the origins of the acetate are, it is still a piece, an interesting piece, actually, of Elvis history. So we're going to get more into that in part three. All right. So be sure to like, share, comment on the video, subscribe if you have not yet already. When we hit 20,000, we're going to give away some cool, cool stuff, including an Elvis Presley-owned item. So definitely subscribe today. If you want to help us in our endeavors, be sure to become a member of the EAP Society. We would love to have you. EAPsociety.com. Click on Become a Member. Paid member tiers. Get the cool perks you see below. Also, don't forget our live event. May 3rd to the 5th, 2024. We're going to be at the Josephine Tope Auditorium in Nevada, Iowa. Three days of Elvis fun that won't break the bank. And again, the proceeds go to helping our endeavors for the society and building our uh, everything that we need to preserve Elvis history in every way that we can. So again, we love you all. And uh, as we always say, be good to yourselves and each other. And always, TCB. My society, my society. Here with all the friends I want to see Don't need no high society To get me where I want to be My society, yeah, that's for me Oh, my society, yeah, that's for me Oh, my society, yeah, that's for me